We ready, Eric? We're getting pretty good with this new format for two minutes to spare. We're getting good at the, at the transition, but good to see everybody, and happy Father's Day to all the, the dads who are here. My old man's unable to be here today, unfortunately, but maybe I'll get to see him later and wish him a happy Father's Day, but grateful for all um, that you all do. We've got some visitors with us this morning as well. Grateful uh, that y'all are here um, as well. Uh, before we get started with our class this morning, let's, let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this day and for everything that you've blessed us with. We're grateful for the opportunity to come together to study your word for a few minutes this morning. We pray that we'll take from it the things that you would have us to, uh, nothing less and nothing more, and that we uh, use those lessons that you teach us and apply them in our lives and use them to be better uh, servants of you. Uh, we pray that you'll be with those who are sick of our number. We know that there are many. We pray that you'll uh, watch over them and heal them. Uh, forgive us for our sins and bless our time together. It's a prayer in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so we are continuing on in our class on Solomon and the divided kingdom. We got Solomon put to bed a few classes ago, so we'll work on the divided kingdom for the rest of our, our trimester. And those of you who are able to be here on Wednesday will remember that we spent a lot of our time talking about the 41-year reign of King Asa. He was remembered as mostly a good king, certainly made some poor decisions there at the end and died with a severe case of gout. But 41 years, pretty stable and extended reign there in the northern kingdom. And so with Ace's reign kind of in the back of our mind, a, a good title for this morning's class would be Meanwhile in Jerusalem, or Meanwhile in Israel, I'm sorry, um, because the northern kingdom was much less, I guess, stable uh, during this period of time. If you lay the timelines across each other, it looks something like this. And so as you can see, Asa actually overlaps with seven different kings of the northern kingdom. I didn't put Jeroboam on there because he would have hung off a pretty good ways to the left. But Asa became king in Judah during the reign of Jeroboam, the, the first king of the north. And Asa would see six additional kings take the throne in Israel uh, during his reign. And I, I've got to tell you, um, at least for me, the other teachers may disagree with this, but it was a little bit of a, a difficult time putting together a class on six kings of the northern kingdom because we don't know a whole lot of details about any of them. We know that they were all evil. That's the easy thing that we can all remember. But we often don't get a whole lot of specific details about the sins that they committed. What do we often just hear about them? Well, they, they progressively get worse. Yeah, that, that's That's true. That's right, and we see some variation of that over and over and over. They walk, continued in the ways, as Scott says, of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and the way that he made Israel sin. So, spoiler alert, that's what all of these six kings will do uh, as we go through uh, this morning. And I've got to tell you that before I found out that I was going to be teaching this class, and I kind of brushed myself up on some of the history, if you had woken me up in the middle of the night and said, name as many of the kings of the northern kingdom as you possibly can, I think I might have gotten Jeroboam, and I probably would have gotten Ahab, but outside of that, I would have had to at least think about it for a little while to, to add to my list very much. These kings, often their reigns were very short, and at the very least, kind of unmemorable uh, because they were uh, so wicked. But I do think that there are some, some lessons for us to be learned, and God wouldn't put, them, put these stories for us in the scriptures if there wasn't something for us to get, so I do think it's good uh, that we spend some time talking about them. I um, also want to point out before we uh, really get going, you may remember um, in our first couple of class periods that uh, Darrell talked to us about some of the differences between the books of Kings and the books of Chronicles. And you may remember that one of those differences is that the books of Chronicles don't say a whole lot about Israel's history that doesn't directly impact Judah, right? It doesn't give us a lot of the northern history that doesn't impact the south, you may have noticed that there was no assignment in Second Chronicles for our reading uh, today, that these kings really didn't have a whole lot to do, with the exception of Ahab and Basha a little bit, uh, with the southern kingdom. Searchable PDFs are a wonderful thing, so I just looked through Second Chronicles out of curiosity, and I found out that Nadab, Elah, and Zimri aren't mentioned in Second Chronicles at all. Omri is only mentioned as sort of a part of a, a family tree, another individual in the story is identified as being his granddaughter. 
Basha is mentioned just in the brief little section about the civil war that he fights with Asa, and then, of course, Ahab is in there quite a bit because of his dealings with uh, Jehoshaphat. But these kings, by and large, don't play a big part in the story um, of the southern kingdom. So that's just sort of a brief introduction, and we'll just go through the text here, starting in 1 Kings chapter 15, if you'd like to get your Bible open, and we will talk about these kings sort of in order. All right. So we'll start with Nadab. He is the son of Jeroboam who takes the throne after Jeroboam dies. And I'll kind of update this little flow chart as we go through this. This helps me. I don't know if it'll help you. But we'll see four different families, you might say, take the throne in Israel in our class period this morning. So for now, just understand that Jeroboam had a son named Nadab who succeeded him. And hopefully as we fill this out throughout the class, it'll make um, some more sense. So Jeroboam's son, Nadab, takes the throne. They're in the southern or the northern kingdom. Now, I've got to tell you, if you walked up to me and said, Ben, what do you know about the Old Testament character Nadab? This probably isn't the Nadab that would immediately come to my mind. There's another Nadab in the Old Testament that's a little more famous, and who might that be? That's right. Abihu's brother, Aaron's son, and what are they famous for? Strange fire before the Lord, right? And what happens to them? Yeah, that's right, some strange fire. Yeah, God, God strikes them dead, and they're often the subject of some of the classic authority lessons and, you know, worshiping God in the way that he's authorized, lessons that are probably good for us from time to time, but not talking about that, Nadab, talking about um, one that is a little bit less famous, but the end of his life isn't terribly peaceful either. So we find that he succeeded Jeroboam, as I said, in the second year of King Asa, and the way that uh, this is worded for him, is that he walked in the way of his father. So instead of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, he walked in the way of his father, continued in the idolatry, continued to allow Israel to worship these golden calves um, at Dan and at Bethel. Really the only, I guess, unique detail we know about Adab or Nadab is really what um, ultimately led to his death. We find that he laid siege to a city called Gibbethon, or Gibbethon, your text may render it, which was a city uh, that belonged to the Philistines. You can kind of see it on the map there. I don't know how well you can see that. It's in the territory that belonged to Dan originally. Now, this map is what the 12 tribes division looked like um, in the book of Joshua when the children of Israel first took the land. So we know that these lines have been redrawn just a little bit. And evidently, the Philistines have marched north and ex expanded their territory in that direction. You may also see the city of Ekron in there that was originally part of Dan, but it was one of the cities that the Ark of the Covenant laid some havoc on the Philistines, um, some history that we talked about a few classes ago. But for now, our purposes, given that now belongs to the Philistines and Nadab and his armies are going to try and take it back. And so they're there and they're ready to siege Gibbethon, but what happens? Nadab is ultimately killed by conspiracy by one of his own officers. Kind of get the picture there. They're sieging and they're attacking another city. And one of his own officers rises up from the ranks and kills him on the battlefield. There is they're ready uh, to besiege uh, Gibbethon. So Nadab is killed and Basha takes the throne. And as Basha comes into power and kills Nadab, he also wipes out the entire house of Jeroboam. And that's the fulfillment of whose prophecy? You remember what Ahijah said to Jeroboam? Yeah, that all of his family would be killed and they wouldn't even get a proper burial, right? That those who died in the city, the dogs would eat their flesh. Those who died out in the country, the, the birds would eat them. And, and that comes to pass as, as Nadab is killed and ultimately Basha uh, takes the throne. Anything else on Nadab? Any unique history details that you all know uh, about him? Well, one other thing that I did mean to notice is that evidently this caused the, the siege to be unsuccessful. <laughs> They're ready to take out Gibbethon, as you might imagine, when the king is killed in that process. It kind of puts a, puts a slowdown on the attack because we'll find here in about 25 years the children of Israel are back besieging uh, that, same, that same city. All right, so let's move on to Basha. He reigns much longer, 24 years there 
um, in the northern kingdom. Um, and this may help you understand the, what I'm trying to do with this flow chart. The household of Jeroboam is now gone. Nadab has been killed, and Basha and his family will now be um, on the throne there in Israel. All right, so Basha reigned 24 years. He is the son of a man named Ahijah. I really wish I could go back and ask some of these Israelite women to come up with some different names for their children because everybody has the same name. It can be a little bit confusing, but this is a different Ahijah. This is not the, the prophet that we've heard about. This is a man from the tribe of Issachar. And, you know, so Ahijah, of course, was the one who tore his cloak with Jeroboam and ultimately um, pronounced his, his judgment. But different man is just the father of Basha. And he became king in Asa's third year, so just shortly after Nadab's um, reign of, of two years. It says that he reigned in Tirzah. So looking back at our same map, originally Tirzah was in Manasseh's territory, and it probably still was um, at this time, just pretty well due north of Jerusalem. So does anybody remember where Jeroboam initially set up his throne and initially sat when he rebelled and, and began the northern kingdom? At Shechem, right? Remember, that's where um, all Israel came to Rehoboam, and he sat there and made his, his important decision. And ultimately, that's where Jeroboam began to reign. But at some point during his reign, he moved to Tirzah. You remember when his son was sick, and he told his wife to go dress up to confuse Ahijah? The son was there in Tirzah, and when she got back to the threshold there, that's when the, the child died. So Jeroboam was reigning there, and the, the writer tells us that that's now where Basha is reigning. There is some question about when and just how long Basha reigned. I know it says 24 years there, and I certainly believe that is the case. But looking at the accounts in 1 Kings and in 2 Chronicles, there's a bit of a, I guess you might say, a discrepancy um, if you're really paying attention. So as we said, Basha began in Asa's third year. He ruled 24 years. 1 Kings chapter 15 tells us that pretty clearly. And that Elah succeeded him in Asa's 26th year. So everything pretty well adds up to this point. Don't get caught up in any off by one kind of detail. The, they often didn't reign exactly a certain number of years, so we may be off one year here or there. But, but that makes sense to us. But then when you look over in Second Chronicles chapter 16, we find a detail that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, at least on the surface. It says that Basha came up against Judah in Asa's 36th year. Does anybody see a problem? According to 1 Kings, he's been dead for 10 years, right? How in the world can he be going up against Judah at this time? I wish I could tell you I have all this figured out, but a few possible uh, solutions uh, to this. Uh, some have suggested that 2 Chronicles should simply say the 16th year. I'm told that the word for 16 and 36 are pretty different or pretty similar, and it would have been rather easy for a, a copy mistake to be made. Others have suggested that the 26th year is more accurate. The, the first option would have put Bosch's attack right after Ace's reforms, after Zerah the Ethiopian attacked him. The 26th year would have put it right at the end of Bosch's reign. So those are a couple of suggestions uh, that have been made. And others suggest that the 36th year of the kingdom of Judah is being referenced and not so much the 36th year of King Asa. That everybody kind of understand the distinction I'm making there. So if you take Rehoboam's 17th year, or 17 years on the throne, Abijam's three years, and then Asa's 15 or 16 years, kind of in accordance with that, that first bullet point, that would get you to the 36th year of the kingdom of Judah and not so much um, King Asa. Uh, does anybody have a real strong preference one way or another on that? Okay. I guess the only question I would have with that is 
family of Beja only brings two more years beyond him, so that doesn't solve a whole lot. For, but, but I mean, I understand what you're saying. That if you couldn't hear Scott, which you probably could, um, he um, says that it could be referring to Bosch's household more so than, than Bosch's reign himself, and that, that's entirely possible. I, I will say that I think we can probably understand what we need to understand from this story without squaring all of that and might go under the category of, of, of interesting, but not necessarily <laughs> too important. So we'll, we'll leave it um, at that. We do know that there, were constant, there was constant war uh, between uh, he and Asa. As we mentioned Wednesday night, he built the city of Rama, which was right there on the border between the northern and southern kingdoms. And what was kind of its purpose? You remember? That's right. It's kind of the customs office, right? And it's a pretty stringent one at that. Don't want people going down from Israel into Judah, and we sure we don't want people going the other direction either. And so we remember from Wednesday night that Asa enlisted Syria uh, to stop um, Bosch's um, efforts there, and they were successful, and he stopped building Rama uh, at that time. And so what was God's attitude towards Bosch's kingship? Did, did God believe that really Bosha came to become the king by a good good means? No, he, he didn't approve of what he was doing, and so he sends Jehu, the son of Hanani. You remember Hanani was the one who prophesied that, that Asa would be judged for enlisting Syria. But his son prophesies against Basha that his whole family would be wiped out. Prophesies the exact same faith that Ahijah spoke against Jeroboam. All, all of your family will be killed. Nobody's getting uh, a proper burial. Just to make sure we all understand, there is another character that we'll see soon named Jehu, who is a king of Israel, a different uh, individual there um, as well. And ultimately, this prophecy comes to pass. In just a minute, Bosch's family will be uh, totally wiped out uh, because of, of his sin. Anything else on Basha? All right, moving right along into Elah. Find, and so there's our flow chart. Basha, um, his son, uh, reigned um, in his place is Elah. And so Elah succeeded Basha in Asa's 26th year. Find that in 1 Kings uh, chapter 16. It says that he provoked God to anger with his idols, just like all of the northern kings of the northern kingdom did. But what we're going to find is just like Nadab did for the house of Jeroboam, Elah is going to end up experiencing the judgment that was pronounced on his father, Basha. So remember, Ahijah spoke that great judgment against Jeroboam's house and said that his whole family would be wiped out. But how did Jeroboam die? He died rather peacefully, right? And ultimately, the, the mass judgment came down during the short reign of his son. And it's a pretty clear pattern that ends up getting set up for Basha and his family. Basha is pronounced judgment. Judgment is pronounced upon him. But he dies rather peacefully. And ultimately, the judgment on his household happens um, during the reign um, of his son. And just like Nadab was, his judgment comes at the hand of one of his... Can you hear me now? Weird. Okay. Maybe I am. Can you hear me now? All right. Sound like a Verizon commercial. Thank you. All right. So where was I? Yes. Okay. So just the way Nadab was, Elah also is betrayed by one of his own people, one, one of the members of his army. The betrayal this time comes at the hands of Zimri, who is the commander of half of the Israelite chariots. So certainly a, a man in a prominent role, and he's ultimately going to rise up against Elah and, um, and kill him and try to reign in his place. The difference is I'm on. That's the only switch I know. You just want me to leave this here, Ryan? Is that... Okay.
All right, you hear me now? Maybe that's a little better, okay. All right, so for the second time, Zimri uh, betrays King Elah and seeks to rule in his place. The commander of half of Elah's chariots rises up and seeks to become king. The difference is, you may remember that Nadab was betrayed on the battlefield. He was there at Gibbethon, and one of his own officers from the camp tries to it ultimately murders him. King Elah was, was back home. He was not part of the siege, uh, the siege of Gibbethon this time. He was at home, says, drinking himself drunk at his steward's home. And ultimately, his, his commander, Zimri, uh, came in and killed him there. And because of this uh, act of treason, uh, the name Zimri is attached with betrayal and treason, really, um, from then on. You might think of somebody like Benedict Arnold. In our own modern vernacular, when you say that name, you think treason, and that's what really gets associated with the name of Zimri later on. You may remember that in uh, 2 Kings chapter 9, when King Jehu, who was assigned the task of wiping out all the house of, of Ahab, he's been anointed king of Israel, and he's going out and killing Ahab's house. He comes to kill Jezebel, who is the last remaining member of the house. Do you remember what Jezebel says to him? She says to Jehu, is it peace, Zimri? So, right, so what does she mean? There's, Jezebel doesn't have dementia. She knows who, who Jehu is. She's saying, you are a betrayer. I'm going to, you know, and she calls him Zimri uh, for that reason. Uh, very good. All right. So that's King Elah. Yeah, as I said, he's killed while drunk at his steward's home. And this is a pretty obvious and shooting fish in a barrel application from a story like this, but I'm going to make it anyway. Well, we need to understand the, the dangers of alcohol and the way that it can make us vulnerable and um, don't need to, that doesn't need to be something we, we play around with and understand all the history that we find in the scriptures, all the things that God has to say about it and just understand that it's something that we are, we are strongly warned um, against. It's very good. All right. Anything else on, on Elah? All right, moving on into King Zimri. Zimri holds the record for the shortest reign of all of the kings, just, just seven days. I think we had a president that reigned for just a few days. I meant to look that up before class, and I forgot. But Zimri, Zimri reigned only, only seven days because um, he was viewed as a traitor, and his kingdom was not received well. So the household of Basha has now died, and the family of Zimri will reign for a, a very, very short time. So he became king by conspiracy in the 27th year of King Asa. And as I mentioned, he, Israel was again encamped against Gibbethon, and he killed Elah and, and raised himself up as king um, at that time. But word of his treason got to the camp. So again, he commits this treason back in Tirzah, and word of that tre treason gets to the camp uh, there in Gibbethon as the Israelites are still engaging in their siege. When they hear about that, they decide that they're going to set up Omri, the commander of their army, as the temporary king. We're going to acknowledge Omri as our king and not Zimri, who has uh, taken out this or completed this coup. And so what do they do? Does anybody remember? They set Omri up as king. They know Zimri has committed this treason back home. That's right. They pick up their camp and they quit sieging Gibbethon. Gibbethon is the real winner in all of this because they've been sieged, besieged twice now and the Israelites because of their own internal battles have, have messed it up both times. So they um, head back to Tirzah and besiege their own royal palace. The children of Is the Israelite army besieges the king's house in Tirzah. Think about what it would be like if the United States army besieged the White House. That's what we have going on here. This false king is now uh, being um, attacked by the army of the nation that he sought to exalt himself over. And so Zimri sees that the armies are marching against him. They see, he, he sees that he's surrounded. And what's he do? Just, that's right. Burns the king's house right down on himself and it commits suicide in that way and destroys um, the palace and ultimately dies after just a very short seven-day seven, seven day reign. Despite his short reign, the writer does go ahead and point out that he walked in the way of Jeroboam. He 
committed this idolatry in the same way that the, all, all the other kings did, despite the fact that he reigned uh, such a short time. Very good. All right, anything else on Zimri? All right, moving right along. Omri, who reigned for 12 years there in Israel. Let's go ahead and read um, a little bit about him. So the family of Zimri is given way to the family of Omri. Let's go ahead and read, starting in 1 Kings chapter 16, starting in verse 21. 1 Kings 16, starting in verse 21. Then the people were divided into two parts. Half of the people followed Tibni, the son of Ginneth, to make him king, and half followed Omri. But the people who followed Omri prevailed over the people who followed Tibni, the son of Ginneth. So Tibni died, and Omri reigned. In the 31st year of Asa, king of Judah, Omri became king over Israel and reigned 12 years. Six years he reigned in Tirzah. And he bought the hill of Samaria from Shemer for two, two talents of silver. Then he built on the hill and called the name of the city which he built Samaria, after the name of Shemer, own, owner of the hill. Omri did evil in the eyes of the Lord and did worse than all who were before him. For he walked in all the ways of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, in his sin by which he had made Israel sin, provoking the Lord God of Israel to anger with their idols. All right, so as I mentioned, Omri was the commander of the Israelite army. And after um, the soldiers found out that Zimri had committed this treason, they temporarily at least acknowledged him as the king. But after Zimri had been killed, evidently another man lifted himself up named, um, I forgot his name, Tibni, that's right, uh, Tibni, however you want to pronounce that. And two camps started to form. Half the people backed Omri, half backed Tibni. I know it's really hard for us to understand what it would be like if half of a particular country backed one particular leader and the other half backed somebody else. I'm sure nobody's ever been in an environment like that, so just, just use your imagination. But these two camps form, and what ends up happening? The people who followed Omri prevailed, and so Tibni died, and Omri reigned. Pretty High stakes election, you might say. If you lose an, an election, so to speak, in those days, you didn't go around speaking at graduations and visiting nursing homes. You were put to death by the king who, who beat you. And so ultimately, Tidna pays the, the ultimate price for trying to raise himself up as the king. Um, Omri became the king in Asa's 31st year, so getting on towards the end of Asa's reign now. And perhaps the most notable um, thing that Omri does is he moves the king's house from Tirzah to Samaria. And this was a good time to move it. And why was that? The old one's just been burned down, right? So if we're going to rebuild one, we might as well <laughs> move it uh, where we'd like uh, to have it. And so about halfway through Omri's reign, it says he reigned six years in Tirzah and six years in Samaria. I guess he stayed at an Airbnb or something like that in, in uh for the short period of time while he didn't um, have a palace. And so um, to move it to Samaria, he ends up buying a hill from a man named Shemer, or Shemer, I don't know how you might want to pronounce that, for two talents of silver. And that's ultimately um, where um, the, the king's palace is built. And Samaria is uh, a name that we understand from our New Testaments, right? We understand um, a little bit about that place. And when we come to the time of Jesus, it's more than just a city, right? It's become a, a larger region. You may remember that after Assyria has wiped out the northern kingdom, some of the Jews remained, and they began to intermarry with Gentiles, and they've kind of become this half-breed, half-Jew, half-Gentile that becomes known as Samari Samaritans, and they aren't viewed real highly um, by the Jews who are still living down there in Judea. Uh, you may see the, the two mountains there, um, Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim, uh, right near Samaria. Does anybody remember what happened at those two mountains back in the book of Deuteronomy? That's right. Which one was blessed and which one was cursed? You remember? Gerizim was blessed. That's right. Had a 50 50 shot. You got, yeah. So Gerizim was blessed and, and Ebal um, was cursed. And that comes up in a conversation that Jesus has, doesn't it? Do you remember? It, the woman at the well um, there in Samaria, our fathers worshiped on this mountain. And you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where, where one ought to worship. So 
the Samaritans worshipped on Gerizim, and the Jews um, thought that um, Jerusalem was the place uh, that they ought uh, to worship. Uh, very good. So it all started by Omri buying this little hill from a man named Shemer and naming the, the city after him, and ultimately this whole region become, ends up bearing uh, that man's name. We found out that Omri walked in the, all the ways of Jeroboam, just like the rest of the northern kings, continues in his idolatry. But it also says that he did worse than all who were before him, right? So he was even more wicked, more idolatrous than all the kings who came before him. Uh, we don't get a whole lot of details about why he was worse. We just, I guess, kind of assume that he, he ramped up the idolatry um, to another level that it, it hadn't seen before. And he was the worst king of Israel to this point, but his pride and joy Ahab will come along here pretty soon and, and take that title from him uh, pretty soon. All right, anything else on, on King Omri? And so Jehu was the one that ultimately killed the house of Ahab, right? So that may have been along the same lines of something that you mentioned earlier, that the house of Omri is now, now Ahab's good. Okay, good. Well, thank you for, for pointing that out. Anything else anybody wants to say? All right, we'll go ahead and move on to our, our last king, one that we know a little bit more about, or at least learn a little bit more about as we grow up in Bible class, King, king Ahab. So we know that he... It was the son of Omri, so that kind of completes our flow chart, and that's the, the family dynasties that, that came to pass um, during this period of, of Israel's history. We know that he succeeded Omri in Asa's 38th year. Let's just go ahead and read that text um, as, as we start to wrap up. First Kings chapter 16, starting in verse 29. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, the son of Omri, became king over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel and Samaria 22 years. Now Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. And it came to pass as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and he went and served Baal and worshipped him. Then he set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a wooden image. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. In his days, Hill of Bethel built Jericho. He laid its foundation with Abiram, his firstborn, and with his youngest son, Sego, he set up his gates, according to the word of the Lord, which he had spoken through Joshua, the son of Nun. So Ahab begins to reign on this new throne there in Samaria and succeeds Omri in Asa's 38th year, right as Asa uh, is about to die. It says that he is the worst of all the kings before him, and he took idolatry to, to really another level, really ramps it up, and sp specifically the worship of, of what idol? Baal, right? And what specifically does he do to facilitate the worship of Baal, you might say? Yeah, he builds a temple, right? A, a temple and an altar to a pagan god in Samaria, right? And he just blatant and really brash in his in his idolatry as he um, continues to worship him and where might he have gotten some of these idolatrous tendencies kind of the same place that solomon got them right his wife and his wife's name was jezebel and where was she from remember from sidon what do we know about sidon we've, we've seen them already one time right in our class 
Remember when Solomon went to go get the, the timber, went to Tyre, and of course Tyre and Sidon, kind of the, the sister cities, and they were just renowned for their idolatry and for their wickedness. Remember Jesus said it'll be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon than, than for these um, Galilean cities. And if it helps you understand that passage, it'll be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon the hometown of Jezebel, <laughs> than for you, right? Just to understand how, how wicked uh, these people were. It says that he made a, a wooden image, right? Which, um, well, I skipped ahead here, but it's all right. He, he built a, a wooden image or a, a pole to the Asherah or Asherah. And what did we say Wednesday night? Um, who, who was Asherah, Asherah? Right, that's right, sort of the, the female counterpart to Baal. So he didn't only build a place for Baal, the male form to be worshipped, but uh, Asherah as well. And in doing so, he did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all of those kings who were uh, before him. Okay, uh, David asked the question if this is the first time that they really start to worship a, a foreign pagan god instead of just worshiping um, Jehovah in, a, in an unauthorized way. Is that sort, that sort of what you're asking? Yeah, um, it certainly seems to indicate that idolatry was a part of Jeroboam's reign. So and I, I take that to mean that they're worshiping other gods as well, but um, others may have a different answer. Right. Uh, originally, right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe a lesson in that for us. We haven't gone after a, a total pagan god, but are we worshiping in the way that's convenient, makes sense to us more so than? the way God has, has authorized. Yeah, very, very good. All right, and Ahab's not going anywhere. Uh, we'll, he'll be around for the next couple of classes. Um, on Wednesday night, uh, Lord willing, we'll talk about his, his showdown with um, Elijah on Mount Carmel and all, all the prophets of Baal, one of everybody's uh, famous stories. And then ultimately he's killed in the, the battle that Lawrence preached on here um, a few weeks ago as um, he goes out um, with Jehoshaphat um, to make war. So very good. Um, yes, ma'am. Yep. I, I don't know if we can say that with any confidence. Others may have a, a different answer for that, but. I will say this for Ahab. We do know that he doesn't mind killing people to get what, get what he wants. Naboth found that out the hard way, right? So he very likely that he, he, he did these things at the cost even of, of his own family. Very good. Anything else that you'd like to add before we kind of wrap up and summarize? Right. Okay.
Okay. Okay. So you're suggesting they were probably killed in some other way, not necessarily offered up. As, okay. Good. Very good. All right. We'll just summarize real quickly. If you can just remember a couple of short flat facts about each of these kings, you'd probably be doing better at least than, than I would have before our, our trimester started. So Jeroboam was first king of Israel, set up the golden calves at Dan and Bethel. He was succeeded by his son, Nadab, who was killed during the first siege of Gibbethon, betrayed by Basha, who sets himself up as king. And he's his main event, I guess, in his life was fighting this civil war um, with King Asa. He was succeeded by his son, Elah, who, like Nadab, just reigned a, a short time and was killed during a siege at Gibbethon, although back home in Tirzah and died, dies drunk. Zimri is the one who carried out that conspiracy. He's known as a traitor and reigned only one week because the Israelite army um, killed him. And by Omri, the commander of the army and the worst king of Israel to that point, became the king and ultimately gave rise to, to his son, Ahab, who was the worst of all and really ramped up the idolatry. So some, some detailed history, but appreciate everybody's attention. Thanks.